Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim in association with Nativ. My name is Davon Mays, and we are going to be talking about Messianic prophecies again. And today we're going to be dealing with the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. Has this been fulfilled? So I need to share my screen. All right. So the new covenant part one, I broke it up into sections because it's a lot of information. I got 55 slides, but I'm going to do about half of those today. So let's get right into it. Cherry picked verses. So what's going on in anybody's world who knows about how the Christians deal with the Tanakh, they'll find a verse, cherry pick it and ignore everything around the verse, right? The whole, even the chapter at times. So this is the famous verse, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Matthew 26 and 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So was the house of Israel and the house of Judah here during the Passover that Jesus ate with his disciples? The answer is no. The 10 tribes were exiled away and Judah, Levi, Benjamin, and there's maybe two more tribes mentioned in the New Testament, but as a whole, Israel was not back in the land to receive this new covenant. So Jesus really made a covenant with his own disciples, not the nation of Israel. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this is important. So you notice in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says the covenant was with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. We know Israel was a split kingdom. So in Matthew 10, 5 through 8 says, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So this new covenant was not intended for the Gentiles early in the ministry of Jesus. He says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles or the nations. Don't tell them about this. Don't go to the Samaritans. So it's like an exclusive club right th at this point, right? We know it changes later. Matthew 15 and 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Excuse me. So again, we got two places. Jesus is saying his message is only for Israel. After the resurrection, this changes. Matthew 26 and 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why, why the message change? Why, after you've been resurrected, would you instruct your disciples to go and baptize all these people in, you know, in this, this Trinity thing going on in Matthew 28, 19? But prior to that, you was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is what people who, you know, who study kind of see how the New Testament evolved as it is being written. It's, it's not consistent. So, I mean, this is just a matter of, you know, in a three-year period, I can't say how much time elapsed from Matthew 15 to Matthew 28, if you was to go into the time frames of all the events. But even if you was to give it a three-year period from the beginning of Matthew to the end of Matthew, why all of a sudden a change? Wouldn't this message be relevant to the Gentiles even before he was supposedly resurrected? It doesn't make sense to change such a dramatic, uh, such, a, such a message in a dramatic way of don't go to them. I was only to the, sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And all of a sudden you want to go baptize everybody, right? And the kingdom of heaven still was not even at hand. So to, to go around preaching that people would have been looking for, maybe that's why he said, don't go to them. They would have been like, where is it at? The Romans still rule Israel, right? So, <laughs> um, so who is this audience? Because the, the new covenant, it said, was for the house of Israel and for the house of Judah. So the audience of Jesus is who? It's the Jews, right? The Jews living in Israel, not the, not the whole house of Israel, not all 12 tribes, right? 
So in Matthew 6 and 7, it says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So this word heathen is interesting because depending on the translation, you, got, you get the word heathen, pagan, publican, Gentile, and tax collector, all translated for certain passages, depending on which translation you use. So Matthew 18, 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So heathen, tax collector, publican, Gentile, these are all referring to the nations in the New Testament. Like I said, depending on the translation. So why would somebody be, why would he say, let them be to you like a heathen or like a Gentile, more like an outsider? And why a tax collector? Who's the tax collectors? Is the Romans the ones collecting the taxes? Which would be Gentiles, right? Or is Israel collecting taxes on themselves? Most likely not, right? Because Rome rules Israel. So why the, the, the down talk to the Gentiles right now, but then you're going to go and preach them this gospel, right? So his immediate audience is not Gentiles because you're not going to be talking to Gentiles and using this type of language saying, you know, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. You know, they, they think this, you know, you, you basically saying don't don't be like these people because you, you are not these people. You're talking about some other nation. Let him be to you like a heathen, somebody who is not of Israel. So his immediate audience is not Gentiles accept nothing from the pagans. 3 John 5 through 7. Dear friend, you demonstrate faithfulness by whatever you do for the brothers, even though they are strangers. They have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone forth on behalf of the name, accepting nothing from the pagans. So this word is Strong's 1482. And also, it is you know, derived from 1484, ethnos, ethnoki, ethni, ethnico, ethnikoi, pagans, a race of people, nation, the nations, heathen, world, Gentiles, all these different translations, basically meaning not Jewish. So don't accept nothing from these Gentiles. But if you're supposed to be going out preaching to the Gentiles, why wouldn't you be accepting things from them? Then you know, there's different, you know, explanations. Don't we, these these are Gentiles that are idol worshipers or they don't believe, but we see that there's a, a, a separation talking about pagans and heathens and Gentiles in the New Testament, depending on what, when you're reading it, in the, when, what time frame you're talking about in the book, and what, what is the message. They're out, out here preaching, but they're saying don't accept nothing from these pagans. Jesus says he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel early in his ministry. Then later on, he says, go to the Gentiles. But we read earlier, the new covenant was for Israel and Judah. And we're going to get to what, what do the nations have to do with the new covenant anyway? We're, we're going to get to that. So like I was saying, publican, pagan, Gentile, tax collector, heathen, one meaning, different words. It means, basically means a non-Jew in the New Testament's context. Matthew 5, 47. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't, do not even pagans do that? So we see again, he's talking about, don't the Gentiles do that? Don't the heathen do that? You see what I'm saying? So this translation says, even the publicans do so, or do not even the publicans so? So we got publican, we got pagan, Matthew 9 and 10. And it came to pass as Jesus sat <clears throat> at meat in the house, Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So again, what's a publican? Depending on your translation. Sometimes it says tax collector. Sometimes it says pagan. Sometimes it says Gentile. Sometimes it says heathen. They're all referring to non-Jews. So here we see Jesus sitting with these same people that he says, you know, don't be like them. Don't accept. Uh, and John says, don't accept money from them. If they're because if they're talking about sinners right here, we see Jesus sitting with sinners and publicans. There's not a problem. But in three, John, it says, don't accept anything from these people. So is this new covenant really for them? According to the Gospels, it kind of depends on where you read in 
in the Gospels? At what time frame? <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some different translations. Berean literal Bible. And if you greet only your brothers, what extraordinary, what extraordinary are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? King James Bible. Do not even the publicans so? New King James Version. Do not even the tax collectors do so? Dewey Reigns Bible. Do not also the heathens this? Good news translations. Even the pagans do that. So we got one verse, one, two, three, four, five different words used for this one verse. So to distinguish between a pagan, a heathen, a tax collector, a publican, and a Gentile, you got to put it in context, but they all refer to non-Jews. Just so anybody who doesn't know that or recognize that when you're reading, go through some different translations and you'll see how the New Testament talks about the pagans and the Gentiles and the tax collectors. They kind of put them all in one box at times. Not all the time, but at times. So who was the new covenant for? Jeremiah 31 and 31. The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Clear as day, right? Hebrews 8 and 8. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It says this also in Hebrews 8 and 8. So who was Jesus talking to when he said new covenant? Because if he was not only if he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, why would Christians or non-Jews even embrace his message if he, they weren't Jews? Why would he explicitly say, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? He doesn't say until I get baptized. He doesn't say until I get resurrected. He doesn't say any, or uh, I'm sorry, he was already baptized at this point, but he doesn't say until they get baptized or, you know, until after I get resurrected, then go preach to them. Right here, he explicitly says, I was not sent except to the house of Israel. So as a Gentile, if you heard this, if you were standing there, what would you think about that, right? So here's a problem with when you read in the, 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 the New Testament, when you're dealing with different gospels, you're going to get different versions of the story that change a lot of what's going on. So remember, it says, I was not sent except to the house of the sheep the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this part right here that I'm going to read is missing from Mark's account. Mark 7, 25 to 29. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syro-Phoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Here we see Jesus calling the Gentiles dogs because this woman is not an Israelite. She's a Greek or a Syro-Phoenician by birth. She answered and said to him, yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Did he have to call her a dog, though? If you was going to heal the woman's daughter, you could have just healed her. Did you have to, like, call her a dog? <laughs> That's like... That's like bad, right? This is the Messiah, right? This is this is who's representing Israel in her eyes. And he's he's calling you a dog, you know? And he's making you basically beg him to do this when it's, I don't know. But anyway, so he doesn't say, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Mark. But he still gives the message of calling her a dog, right? So we see the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the Christian context at the time. Now, we know that Israel does have certain laws where they don't mingle certain things with Gentiles. That's for sure. But calling them dogs on GP, that's not what the, the Torah doesn't teach that. If you're going to be a light to the Gentiles, you can't be referring to people as dogs when they come to you for help. Like, that's, that's not going to work, right? That's, that's Kilu Hashem, and that's, that's embarrassing the name of God. That's actually a huge punishment for that. So if they want to say Jesus said that and embrace that, then that's a huge problem, according to the Tanakh. But so 
who broke the covenant in the first place that it needs to be reestablished? Jeremiah 11 and 10. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. So when, when the new covenant is established, it's established with the people who actually broke the covenant, not with the disciples of Jesus. Even though they're Israelites, it wasn't for a new religion which we call Christianity today, to take this covenant and make it their own and change all the dynamics concerning it. Jeremiah 50, 44 through 6. In those days and at that time, said the Lord, the children of Israel shall come and they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces uh, thither, thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be broken. Here we go, right? My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have returned. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. So we see the same language here. We see Jesus saying that he's only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if he was truly the real Messiah, when he said that concerning the new covenant, that would be accurate only concerning the new covenant because it was for Israel and Judah. However, Gentiles can join the covenant, but they're not the ones who broke it and had to reestablish it. That's the key takeaway here. So to try to make it seem like the church is the new Israel is to make it seem like the church had the covenant and broke it and then they got a new covenant. No. Israel and Judah had a covenant, broke it, and they're the ones getting the new covenant. And the Gentiles who will see the light that Israel displays will join themselves to this new covenant. It wasn't given to the church. It clearly says Israel and Judah. Matthew Poole's commentary. So Mark says, and in, in, uh, I'm going to go back to um, something I talked about earlier. Mark 7, 27, Jesus said to her, let the children first be filled, for it's not meat by the children here, he means the Jews, by the dogs, he means the heathen. So when he, at first, when he was talking about don't, don't go to the Gentiles, he refers to them as dogs when the lady asked the question, right? So the Jews are called the children of the kingdom, right? This is according to Mark Poole's commentary. Israel is called God's son, his firstborn, Exodus 4.22. The apostle in Romans 9.4 says, to them belong the, the adoption. By bread here, our Savior means the public, pub, publication of the gospel and the miracles by which the truth of the doctrine of it was confirmed. By dogs, he means the heathen, whom the Jews did count as dogs. So uh, no members of the household of God. It was a term of contempt. Why would somebody who's supposed to be the Messiah even keep this content? If he was all about love and peace and all this stuff, why would he even promote such contempt if this is what the relationship was between Israel and the heathen at that time? Because the, 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 the true Messiah is supposed to bring peace. It says he will speak peace to the nations in Zechariah 9, 10. They love to read Zechariah 9 and 9, but the very next verse in Zechariah 9 and 10 says he will speak peace to the Gentiles. Calling her a dog would not be inviting her to want to join your new covenant. So that wouldn't even make any sense. I just had to bring this back up because and show you that, like I said here, Israel and Judah, the house of Israel and Judah have broken the covenant. Right? So when we read here, this lady's asking, are you the Messiah? Can you heal my kid? He calls her a dog. And we see here what this relationship was. So if Jesus was the true Messiah, calling this woman a dog would not be inviting her to want to join your new kingdom or your new covenant anyway. And is, could that be why he said, don't go to the Gentiles? He thought they were dogs. Then all of a sudden, after the resurrection, go and preach to everybody, right? Now you need disciples. Now you need people to follow you. Okay, whatever. We know the message changes like that in the, in the New Testament. 
but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Again, this is the covenant with the house of Israel, not the Gentiles. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is completely anti-Christian because the, 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 the New Testament under Paul says you're not under the law anymore. Why would God, God take the law away when you're under a new covenant according to Jesus? If he's supposed to put it in your heart, if the condition is, this shall be the covenant when I put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, right? If Jesus set up a new covenant, why would Paul turn around and tell you under this new covenant, the law is no longer in effect? It was abolished. How can that even be? You're under grace now. We don't see grace right here. I will put my law in the inward parts and write it in our hearts. They don't say I will give you grace. Remember, Paul said in Galatians 1.12, he didn't get his gospel from no man. He got it from a revelation from Jesus. So if that's true, and Jesus established a new covenant, and this is the new covenant condition, according to Jeremiah, to put the laws of God in people's hearts, why would Paul be preaching against the law so hard? Why would Paul in, in Hebrews 7.18 say the law is not profitable, it's weak and useless? Read Hebrews 7.18. Why would he say in Hebrews 7.12, it needs to be changed? That's not what the new covenant says right here in Jeremiah 31. So we see this new covenant doesn't jive with what the gospels teach about it. Jeremiah 32, 36, and 42. And now, therefore, thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof ye say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath, I will bring them again into this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me from forever for the good of them, excuse me, and, the, and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yeah, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus said the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. What good came to Israel after they accepted this so-called new covenant in the New Testament? Nothing good came after that. They began be, to, be, to get uh, persecuted. Paul started killing them and throwing them in jail. The Romans start the, the, uh, in the book of Acts, it says Herod harassed the church and killed James with the sword. I mean, it just gets bad and worse. So where's all the good that comes after this everlasting covenant is made if it was established in the New Testament? It's not there. It's not there. So concerning the Gentiles, they do join, but they do not replace the new covenant. Isaiah 66 and 18, for I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So they're going to see the glory of the Most High. And what is that going to do? Jeremiah 3 and 17, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk anymore after the imagination of their evil heart. They shall be joined together or gathered together to the name of the Lord. It doesn't say to Yeshua, and we know the name of the Lord is not Yeshua. Zechariah 2 and 11, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know the Lord of the hosts have sent me unto thee. Many nations shall be joined. Doesn't say that they're going to replace Israel. They're going to join Israel 
under this new covenant because they're going to see the light of Israel that they give to the nations when they repent. And the Most High is going to bring them back into their land and give them all the promises he promised them, like it says back here in Jeremiah 32, 36 to 42. Read it for yourself. So the book of Hebrews changes the words of Jeremiah. Check this out. Hebrews 8 and 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, said the Lord. Where does Hebrews get I regarded them not at? Quoting Jeremiah. It'd be different if he was just preaching and said, God said this, I regarded them not. But when you quote word for word, not, not according to the covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them out of the land of Egypt, that I made with their fathers in the day I took them out of the land of Egypt, basically, they continue not in my covenant, which my covenant they break. Then he completely adds the words, I regarded them not. Then he says, saith the Lord. This says, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. He completely changed the verse and said, saith the Lord. That's pretty bold, if you ask me. I mean, wow. But see, if, if, you're, not, if you're not paying attention, this will go right over your head. He doesn't say I regarded them not. It says, although I was a husband unto them. So they playing with the text. If you got to do all these tricks and, and, and manipulations, what, what kind of message really do you have? The husband of Israel. So let's get into this. Jeremiah 3, 1 through 2. They say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and become another man's, may he return to her again? Would not the land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with... Yet, but you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet, return to me, says the Lord. So the Christians love this verse. They say, see, since God divorces Israel, they can't go back to him. So that's why Jesus got to come and marry the bride, the, the, the bride of Christ got to come to Jesus, right? But right here it says, yet, return to me, even though you played the, part, the harlot and you had many lovers. Come back. You see how they, they love to leave verses out or add them. It's one of the two. They're never going to give you the whole context. They're going to chop it in half. They're going to cherry pick it. It's never going to be the whole context. Yet return to me. Why would he say return to me if that's not what he meant? It's clear right there in the verse. I will not remain angry forever. Let's get into some more of this. Jeremiah 3, 11 through 15. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the toward the north and say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and I and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I'm going to read that again. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. They done broke the covenant. They done left. They done had many lovers. It says they 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 given their charms to every alien deity. I'm married to you, but return. I will take you. <laughs> I will take you. See, the Christians don't want to read this to you. They don't want to read this part. It doesn't say I don't like you no more. It says, I will take you, run from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion. Uh, is that the rapture? Uh-oh. <laughs> is, is that where the rapture comes from? You see how they play all these games? And I will give you shepherds according to my heart and who, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding, who will teach you this Torah. I am married to you. I will take you after he just said, you're doing all this foul stuff. Only acknowledge your iniquity. Say, I'm sorry. Say you was cheating. Say, I'm sorry. Repent. 
teshuva, do teshuva, and I will take you. I, I didn't write this. I will take you. Run from a city and two from a family. I'm not even going to make no more jokes about that. <laughs> it's right here in the text, y'all. Just read the text yourself. For thy maker is thine husband. Jeremiah 3 and 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so you have treacherously departed, or tre so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Yep, they was treacherous. But what did he say in Jeremiah 3.20? See, they'll read 3.20. What did he say in Jeremiah 3.11 through 15? No. I will take you. I am married to you. So they'll just go here in 3.20. Says, see, Israel, they, they, they was treacherous with God. He's mad at them. Yeah, he was mad. But he'll take them if they say, I'm sorry. Doesn't it say in, in Isaiah, the, the Redeemer will come to those who repent? That's all you got to do is repent. Isaiah 44 and 5. For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. The God of the whole earth. That's the Gentiles joining Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Not the Gentiles replacing Israel in the new covenant especially in the new covenant that has borne no fruit. It says, I'm going to show you all the good that I promised you when I give you the new covenant, according to Jeremiah that I read earlier. Now I'm going to destroy my temple and scatter you to the nations. After I gave you a new covenant? Really? That doesn't even make sense. That's like getting married and kicking your bride out the house. What are you doing? Instead of a honeymoon, you tell her to get out. What is that? And, and then take her and put her in jail. Not only she got to get out, but she got to go to jail after you married her and gave her a ring and an engagement or a, a whole wedding ceremony. As soon as you get married to her, you kick her out and put her in jail. That, is that what the whole bride of Christ thing was? What's going on? The husband of Israel. So this is lengthy. But this is just going to drive the point home of how, yes, Israel was treacherous. They put in a lot of bad work. But the Most High always said, come back to me. I will take you. I made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not going to break my covenant. Y'all going to break it, but I'm going to continue to show you love. Hosea 2, 1 through 5. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges, for she is not my wife nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlot cheese from her, from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her a, like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children for they are the children of harlotry for their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. We know this is the whole, if you read Hosea, it's a pretty detailed situation of him marrying a woman and she's having kids with other people. It's a, it's a whole situation. Hosea 2, 6 through 10. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and I will and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, oil, and multiply her silver and gold, which she prepared for ball. Therefore, I will return and take my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and I will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. Hosea 10, 15, 2, 10 through 15. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. So 
I will punish her for the days of the balls to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of Accor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up from the land of Egypt. Hosea 2, 16 through 20. And it shall be in that day, said the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the balls and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, with the birds of the air and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle, I will shatter, I will shatter from the earth. To make them lie down safely, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in love and kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So after all the problems, she out here running around with all the Gentiles and worshiping their gods, I will betroth you to me forever in righteousness and justice, in love and kindness and mercy. See, they don't want to read these verses to you. They only want to cherry pick the ones where he's upset and it sounds like he's done with her. They don't want to read these verses to you. Hosea 2, 21 through 22, 23. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine and with oil. They shall, they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. I will have mercy on her. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. Why don't they tell you this part? Because they cherry pick. It's very convenient to cherry pick the verses, and they know people are not going to go back and look this up. They pull on the heartstrings, and next thing you know, you in the church. That's how it works. The missionaries are very good at what they do, unfortunately. There's a verse in Ezekiel that says there are men who are skilled at destruction. I'm not saying that that's referring to the church, but people can be good at being bad, unfortunately. The husband of Israel, Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light, by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus said the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will cast off the seed of Israel, all the seed of Israel, for all they have done, says the Lord. So we see right here, there's a whole prophecy or, 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 or a proclamation of if you can get rid of the ordinance of the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, and how they work, then he would get rid of Israel. But as far as I know, it's a lot of weather going on, and there's a lot of astronomers employed. So there's no way you, anybody has gotten rid of the celestial powers and the way the earth and the sun and the moon and stars have the relationship with each other. So with that being said, that's the end of the new covenant. That was part one. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions if anybody has any, and I'm going to unshare my screen.